Um, thank you all so much for joining the Palo Alto City Library for our final Book to Action event. Um, we wanted to design a series of events that were based on um, building awareness and community for uh, the senior citizens who live in Palo Alto and um, you know who are very much a part of our community but who are often sort of neglected or we don't think as much about um, making contact and, and engaging really um, really strongly with that with that group um, book to action is a state library california state library funded um, program that builds on a sort of book club concept where we select a book that's based on an issue that is important to the community and um, you know we take that book we do a book discussion a service project to really get some good engagement and connection within um, within the community around a particular issue for Palo Alto as I started thinking about how you know what kind of issue was going to was going to be really important for us um, you know I was looking at all kinds of things and including like our demographic statistics and realized Palo Alto is nearly 25 percent senior citizens which is pretty significant um, and it seemed to me that you know we had a really great opportunity to build awareness not only of senior citizens but those who are living with um, dementia alzheimer's other memory care issues um, and thinking about how to um, build empathy and awareness for for that group of people to build understanding so we selected a graphic novel called Wrinkles. It was also made into an animated film. So both the graphic novel and the animated film are available through our e-library resources. And um, what I really wanted to focus on with our speakers was um, how to engage with seniors and especially those who are living, you know, maybe in care facilities and living with Alzheimer's or dementia to you know still try to make that meaningful contact um, you know when i was starting to think about this we were definitely in a pre-pandemic situation and um, you know so things like visiting care facilities was a lot easier than it is now so how how do we kind of rethink being engaged how do we rethink helping address isolation um, in a sort of mid-pandemic um, environment and continue with, um, you know, with building those relationships. So our service project was really based on um, creating connection, hopefully some intergenerational connection with um, writing what we're calling letters of love. So the letters that we have collected over the month of August, um, we will be quarantining for 96 hours and then delivering to care facilities in the area um, and hopefully developing some um, good pen pal relationships there with our seniors. Um, we also in the series of events that we've put together, we did a documentary film screening of a film called The Genius of Marion, which uh, chronicled a family's journey of watching a loved one progress through an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Um, it was really a, a powerful film and we had a great discussion with the filmmakers last week. Um, had a great book discussion that was helped um, along with being facilitated by our graphic novel book club and the English language version. Um, the editor of that was able to join us. Um, so the editor of Wrinkles um, for the English language version was able to, to be with us. Um, two weeks prior and um, we've had this ongoing letter writing project which has been um, we've had a really great response to that so we're very excited for tonight's panel discussion with um, Haiwan and Alana so thank you both so much for being here this evening um, we will kick it off with Haiwan who is and she's a rising senior this year at Gunn High School so one of our local high schools and I'll let Haiwan kind of talk about her engagement with the, the senior community, particularly with the Alzheimer's community, to talk about um, 
you know, her work, uh, her engagement, and um, what she sees is really the importance of young people being involved with the lives of seniors. And then um, Alana will speak uh, to just some other bigger ideas about how to engage with seniors, particularly during this COVID pandemic. Um, I'll share in the chat some resources for how to get involved locally, and um, we will also be happy to take any questions and answers. So you can drop any questions into the chat, and at the sort of end of the presentations, we will move into some, some Q&A. So uh, Hylan, I'll let you get started. Um, I'm going to be sharing a presentation. So let me pull that up. Can you guys all see the presentation? Okay. So um, thank you so much for the introduction, Allison. Um, so to begin, I'll just first uh, give a little bit further introduction of myself. So my name is Hewan An, and I'm a senior at Gun High School, as Allison had said. And initially, my interest in neuroscience and neurodegenerative diseases uh, brought me to volunteer at Alzheimer's Association with my neuroscience club at school and now I'm an advocate supporting seniors with and without dementia. So um, this is kind of a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. So I'll be talking about three major projects I did in high school, um, which include an interview, research, art, and then I'll be giving my final takeaways and conclusion. So to begin, I'll be talking about my interview. So my first project was an interview with caregivers, a geriatrician, and a senior with dementia. Um, and here are some pictures I took during the interview. I had the opportunity to ask them questions ranging from how having a reliable method to diagnose Alzheimer's early may have changed their consequent decisions or lifestyle to ways they cope with the disease currently. And talking to caregivers like David and Betty, I realized that this disease is difficult to manage, not only for the individual with the disease, but also for the family members and the caregivers. And David's tears as he shared his regret for becoming frustrated with his wife and hearing about a caregiver in Betty's support group who fainted from stress, I was able to better understand the great emotional stress that comes with this disease through these series of interviews. Especially since the experience of every family affected by Alzheimer's disease is not the same, both caregivers and individuals need great support to alleviate the emotional and financial burden. And remember, Alzheimer's and dementia in general still does not have a cure, even though one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia. And there still needs to be much more research funding, education, and public health infrastructures for our seniors with dementia. And the only way we can ach achieve this is through your help. So one suggestion I can give is going to AIM or Alzheimer's Impact Movement, which is an affiliate of Alzheimer's Association. And by going to their website, you can easily learn about ways to help, such as joining other advocates to ask Congress to increase the funds for research or urge them to support the Improving Hope for Alzheimer's Act. And just by typing their name um, and going to their website, you'll be able to learn about actions you can take and other acts that need to be passed. And so it is very important for us to seek ways to reduce the emotional and financial burden for our individuals with Alzheimer's and our caregivers. Um, and with the collaborative work I did with my friends and seniors, we were able to produce a 40 minute video sharing personal stories from people affected by Alzheimer's. And through this video, we hope to spread awareness and share a part of the reality of this disease. Although the experiences, as I've mentioned before, are different for every family, the hopes of all of the interviewees were the same, a cure to Alzheimer's. As a couple of our interviewees, and I shared the video to Anne Ream, who is uh, the Secretary of Congresswoman and the SU, uh, we, ho we hoped to encourage her to support actions that assist seniors, and I could during, during this process, I could really feel the importance of our advocacy. We were effectively showing our legislators why they need to increase research funds and improve facilities and education needed to help their seniors. And not only this, I could also see the power of intergenerational collaboration. In one room, advocates between the ages 17 and 70 
were more effective sharing their experiences and skills together to, to achieve a common goal. And I think it is very important to understand that you can make the change and know that intergenerational collaboration can be very influential. There is another major change we need to make as an individual and a community. When I asked Danis, who was a senior with dementia, one of my interviewee, what makes her happy, she said in her exact words, talking to people like you, people who are interested in this disease and study it without thinking I'm an idiot or did something wrong or never be able to live a normal life. Danis loves to talk with others, just like we do, especially as a retired member of New Mexico House of Representatives. Yet she has experienced people who define herself completely as a disease, immediately having assumptions that she can no longer socialize or communicate. As shown by Danisic's experience, there is stigma surrounding seniors with dementia. People assume that an individual with Alzheimer's is not capable of anything and therefore do not try to talk to them, creating a barrier between themselves and the individual with Alzheimer's. Soon, the elder individual with Alzheimer's can be completely isolated, no longer invited to conversations or social activities. So this leads to my second project, uh, which is a very short research on causes of caregiver burden and stigma, um, inspired by my interviewee's comments. And by comparing the causes of burden and stigma between US and my home country, South Korea, and collaborating between research papers, I concluded that lack of education was the main cause of caregiver burden and stigma for both countries. Lack of education on how to care for individuals with the disease and not learning from families who have directly been affected can lead to both heightened burden and stigma. Educating yourself is important in any setting. Before you act, it is important to ask yourself whether your impact matches your intention and question your biases. As I have mentioned before and will continue to do throughout my talk, I strongly encourage the young people to educate themselves in this topic and learn how you can lead the next generation of advocates to make up a society without social isolation and stigma against our seniors with dementia. And to help reduce social isolation for seniors, especially during this time in our community, uh, my friends and I decided to host free art, free online art classes. And you can see um, some of our classes in the pictures in the presentation. Uh, we also saw that art helps individuals with dementia improve fine motor skills and memory. And over the several months, we have developed a strong bond with each other as we painted various art projects, ranging from paper collages to painting with acrylic. And we love to hear Danis, who also participated in many of her art classes, say that she felt young again, and Tom's eagerness to learn as he studied how to paint with acrylic even before the start of our classes. And we, my friends and I also loved the friendship we were able to build and talking with their seniors became the highlight of our week. Intergenerational connections are valuable and the benefits are not unidirectional. They go both ways. The benefits include, but are not limited to, growing respect for everyone of all ages, reduced ageism and stigma, increased wisdom and self-esteem boost, and of course, the precious friendship. So how can you help? To reduce social isolation for seniors, share a hobby you enjoy doing, such as art, like my previous example. Just like any other friendship, sharing a common interest with others can be the start to an everlasting relationship. Be creative and bond with seniors in your own way. And understand that intergenerational connections are irreplaceable and valuable. To support seniors with Alzheimer's disease and dementia in ways mentioned previously, you can join the annual Silicon Valley Walk to End Alzheimer's hosted by Alzheimer's Association. And this year, the walk is going to be everywhere. And the walk, you can walk with your close family members and friends in your community to spread awareness and advocate. And most of the money you fundraise through this walk will stay at the community level to support our seniors. I strongly encourage you to join this walk, the walk this year by registering as a team captain as your first step in becoming an advocate. And in the photo, you can see uh, my friends and I attended the walk last year. And this year, the format will be slightly different because of the pandemic, but the goal is still the same. And there, will, there are links posted in the Palo Alto Library website where you can find more resources and information on ways you can help, um, such as the Longest Day, which is also another event 
held by uh, Alzheimer's Association. And um, as I said before, um, I really believe that young people are very important for continuing this movement. Um, the young people will determine where our support and research will be in the future as we are responsible for the trajectory of our advocacy. And so I really encourage everyone to educate yourself on how to support seniors with dementia and take action. Thank you very much for um, listening. And if you guys have any questions after the talk, you can email me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aiwan. Um, so please, if you've got questions, feel free to um, drop them in the chat um, after we move through Alana's presentation presentation will be um, doing some Q&A as well. So I will now turn it over to Alana and thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking the time out to come and be part of this event. Um, I'm really excited for the opportunity to talk a little bit about loneliness and social isolation and living with dementia and the way that those things tend to interact together. To give you a little bit of background about me, um, I am a global health professional. I have a master's degree in public health and I'm also an advocate on dementia research and for people living with dementia. Uh, my father died of Alzheimer's disease and he lived at home with us where we cared for him. On, until the end. And I gave a TED talk talking about that experience to help raise awareness around dementia and Alzheimer's. So I'm really pleased to be here today and build out a little bit on some things that I've been thinking about in terms of dementia and social isolation right now in this pandemic when everybody is at risk for loneliness. The thing about loneliness and dementia is that they're actually a vicious cycle. They feed into each other. If you're lonely or you're socially isolated, it significantly increases your risk of developing dementia. And once you're diagnosed with dementia, that diagnosis increases your risk of loneliness. And being lonely is bad for absolutely everybody. Uh, Long-term loneliness is actually associated with specific bad health outcomes, uh, risk of increased risk of premature death, elevated risk of heart disease and stroke, and it's associated with more visits to the doctor and more visits to the emergency room. It also looks like, based on the research we've seen, that loneliness contributes to cognitive decline, that it contributes to dementia through a bunch of different mechanisms, actually. Um, loneliness can lead to physical inactivity because you don't have anybody to exercise with or you don't feel safe going out alone. Um, loneliness can cause depression, which is something that leads to cognitive decline. Loneliness can lead to poor sleep and increased blood pressure, increased inflammation, and all of these things can contribute to dementia. Loneliness and social isolation has also been linked directly to the brain changes that occur in Alzheimer's disease. That is the buildup of beta amyloid and tau proteins in the brain. The theory is that psychological distress, like loneliness, causes the buildup of that in the brain and they activate sort of a constant biological stress response, which makes the beta amyloid and tau proteins accumulate. And of course, loneliness is also really common, especially in older people. There have been a decent number of studies on this. And in the US, loneliness studies have found affects between 19% and 43% of adults age 60 and older. And the numbers get worse when you look at people living with dementia. Um, they report, at least a third report feeling lonely. And part of that is because of the diagnosis. A diagnosis of dementia increases your risk of social isolation. That can be the result of having to move into specialized accommodation like assisted living or memory care and moving away from friends and family and social networks. And it can also come from the stigma of a dementia diagnosis. I saw this with my father 
um, the way that knowing that he had Alzheimer's disease made his friends nervous and his friendships, he was a college professor, his friendships were based on intellectual connections and people decided very quickly and, and wrongly in the beginning that he wasn't going to be able to maintain that kind of friendship and they just kind of slipped away and it was really hard for him. So I should note here that social isolation and loneliness are not actually the same thing. Um, isolation is objective and it has a formal definition, which I wrote down to make sure I got it right. The absence of social contact or contact with friends and family, the absence of community involvement and lack of access to services. So functionally, social isolation can actually be measured by the number of contacts that a person has. Loneliness, on the other hand, is subjective. Loneliness is an emotion. It's an emotional response to a situation. It's the feeling of being alone. Some people can feel lonely even if they have regular contact with friends and family. And other people can spend most of their time alone and never feel lonely. So loneliness is harder to get a hold on because it's an emotion and because it's so subjective and so personal. There's also two different kinds of loneliness emotional and social. Emotional loneliness is feeling the lack of a close personal connection. It's not having another person that you feel a deep attachment to. And social loneliness is the lack of a social network or a group of friends or neighbors or colleagues. So social loneliness is about not having a group to belong to. So emotional loneliness is about not having a person that you feel a deep connection to. Social loneliness is about not having a group. Which leads me to the point that um, pretty much everything that we see about loneliness and about social isolation says that the solution is to increase face-to-face -face visits. The solution is personal companionship. And of course, we're living through a pandemic right now, which means that that isn't possible the way that it used to be. So what do we do then? How do we support our loved ones living with dementia when we can't do the kinds of face-to-face -face visits that we used to do? So there are some things we can do to help decrease the impact. Nothing is going to match the ability to go and sit with someone and talk to them and be next to them, but there are things that will help. One of which is actually, you know, I think intuitive to everybody and it's video calls, specifically one-on-one -on -one video calls. Because even when someone's in quite an advanced stage of dementia and they have trouble following a conversation, they can recognize a familiar face. They can recognize a loving voice. So tools like Skype or FaceTime can have a really beneficial effect on people living with dementia. Now this may take experimentation to really succeed because different people will respond differently to different devices and different mediums. So someone might be uncomfortable with the idea of the FaceTime call of like holding the phone and trying to figure out how to have that conversation, but do just fine when they're doing Skype on a computer because the bigger screen is more comfortable. Someone else might find the phone to be familiar and the computer to be unsettling. So if it goes badly on Skype, it's worth trying a different method of connection, a different gadget to do your connecting with. There can be a little bit of troubleshooting to find the thing that most, that's most comfortable for everyone. Now, another thing that can help is uh, visual tracking and representation of visits and social contacts. Because this is, this is, I think, genuinely ironic that some people with dementia can feel lonely because they don't remember that a visit took place and they don't remember that a phone call took place. So they feel like they've been alone forever. So a caregiver can actually help support this and help to eliminate this feeling by tracking social visits, ideally with visual representations. So with a video call, this can actually be pretty simple. You can print out a screenshot 
you can make a scrapbook of phone calls or conversations that have taken place. You can put them up on a cork board where someone can see them and know that they've been getting this, these visits and that people remain parts of their lives. And the key is to make sure that these visual representations are easily accessible like a scrapbook that someone can get out and handle on their own, something that's sturdy enough, you're not worried about it being harmed, or you know, a bulletin board where it can be seen every day in a location that's obvious and clear. Another thing that technology makes easier is video recordings. Since we're doing video calls anyway, with permission, caregivers can record entire video calls to be replayed later. And that gives the person living with dementia the chance to listen to the conversation again, maybe pick up a detail that they missed, a nuance that they didn't understand before, or somebody who's further along in dementia, the chance to hear the whole conversation again and to realize that they were part of this conversation and it really did happen and they have not been alone forever. You can also ask friends or family who might not be comfortable calling, who might be put off by stigma or fear of doing the wrong thing to record short video messages, which you can then play for somebody living with dementia or even assemble an entire playlist that a person could watch before bedtime or when they got up in the morning. And again, once you have these sorts of video resources, you can replay them as often as you want. And for, for many people living with dementia, that kind of familiarity and repetition is deeply comforting and helps to minimize feelings of loneliness or of isolation. Another thing that can help is to put structure around the social contacts that do take place. If possible, visits or video calls should take place on a schedule, the same time every day, the same day every week, even people who have only a minimal sense of the passage of time, that kind of structure and repetition is comforting and it makes them feel safe and it makes them know that like this happened, this will happen again. It gives them a place within a series and that knowledge that they are living in a series of social contacts, that this is not a one-time thing is comforting and again helps to minimize feelings of loneliness and of isolation. The last suggestion is one that's actually going to seem kind of weird, but bear with me. The last suggestion is television. If it's used correctly, television can help to reduce loneliness, not just in people living with dementia, but actually in everyone. The social surrogacy hypothesis was uh, posited by psychological researchers at the University of Buffalo about 10 years ago. And it states that when people lack relationships in their life, they seek out substitutes like television characters. So in the words of these researchers, um, television can create feelings of belongingness when no real belonging is available. It can reduce feelings of loneliness and abandonment. So to make this work for someone living with dementia, it has to be thoughtfully and carefully done. Um, one or two television shows only should be selected. They should have comforting and positive themes. They should have a small group of characters that you can get attached to and invested in. And then there should one or two episodes should be shown each day at around the same time almost treated like it's a video call with that kind of structure and repetition. And then a single season or two of TV can be repeated over time so that again, it grows more deeply familiar. This doesn't mean leave the TV on all the time. You know, like TV is background noise, which I'll get into in a little bit, is not particularly effective. But letting people feel an emotional connection to a specific group of characters that is not going to trigger feelings of psychological distress can really help people feel less lonely. There are also approaches to reducing loneliness that don't seem to work, that can cause confusion or unhappiness among people living with dementia, and you need to be aware of that. And one of them is trying to do voice telephone calls. Now, people are all different, and people living with dementia are all different. So, some people may love a regular phone call. 
you know, people of a certain generation who grew up talking on the phone may still retain that habit, enjoy it. But for many people with dementia, phone calls are just too hard to follow. There's no visual cue, voices may not be familiar in the same way that faces are. And if you're already having trouble following a conversation, trying to do it on the phone can just be too difficult. Another thing that can be overwhelming or upsetting for people living with dementia is group video calls, like a big family Zoom call or um, a bunch of people getting together, passing the phone around from face to face. It can be disorienting to track all those different people. It's hard to have an easily followed thread of conversation or of discussion. I mean, if you've ever been on a work Zoom call, and watch the challenge that people have trying to hold a meeting over Zoom. It's horrible. I mean, frankly, it's horrible. And it's also horrible for people living with dementia. So video calls should be one-on-one. -on -one. They shouldn't be meetings. And the other benefit of that is it means more social contact time. Because talking to 10 people for 10 minutes means 10 minutes of social engagement. Talking to 10 people one-on-one -on -one 10 minutes each, that's 100 minutes of social engagement. That's a lot more time spent in the company of others. And if you choose to record those phone calls for future replay, those are much easier to follow and understand than a chaotic group conversation. I mean, there's exceptions, you know, like if someone has grandchildren, all you can really do is like pick the baby up and hold them in front of the screen and try to get them to do something cute. I'm not saying anyone should be having long one-on-one -on -one conversations with two-year-olds. But in general, if possible, video calls should only include one person talking to the individual with dementia. And then finally, like I mentioned, you can't just turn the TV on and pretend like it's company. TV is background noise on all day tuned to ESPN or the soap opera channel or whatever is going to do more harm than good. People with dementia already have trouble screening out different noise sources. And having that TV to screen out can lead to a loss of cognitive function on a daily basis in terms of day-to-day -day movement around. And if those TV shows, you know, if they have a lot of dramatic or upsetting content, it can be upsetting, it can be confusing, it can just be too much to process. So you want your television to be limited, specific shows, friendly characters, themes that aren't going to involve anything frightening or upsetting. So I would love to hear what's been working for other people in terms of trying to reduce loneliness and social isolation right now in this pandemic, because we're all feeling lonely and socialized, socially isolated. And those of us who don't have dementia aren't facing these extra burdens of cognitive loss, of stigma, of being in facilities that may or may not be allowing visitors. So I, I would love to hear what's working for everybody in this time of challenge. And thank you so much for listening to me today. Thanks. Um, you know, I have, both of actually my maternal grandparents have Alzheimer's uh, diagnoses, um, which has been kind of hard to watch that progression. Um, it's also been hard to watch, um, like my mom in particular, who's been um, a caregiver for my grandparents, um, kind of take that burden on and watch that burden sort of increase. Um, and for a time as well, my younger sister was serving as a, as a caregiver for my grandparents. So, um, you know, I don't know if you've got um, any kind of words about like the impact on caregivers and, and how we might help support caregivers in this time. Um, the library has um, some, some kits that are available for checkout for uh, not only um, caregivers, there's a caregiver support kit, but we also have kits to help engage um, the seniors themselves who have uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, Many of them are based around sort of a specific decade with, as you said, like movies or music that's familiar to them from the decades that sort of mentally they may be more focused into. So um, that's definitely a resource that's available from the library. But, you know, sort of back to the caregiver question, I just wondered if, um, you know, what thoughts you might have in, in that regard. 
So I feel like a lot of the advice that caregivers get can be really frustrating for caregivers, you know, take time for yourself and, you know, remember that, you know, you have to put yourself first. And the fact is like, often you're exhausted and like, where are you supposed to find this time that you're taking for yourself? So in reading about people under stress and then about under long-term chronic stress, you can find sort of guidance for what to do for caregivers. And there's some small things that can help with the sort of chronic challenge of being overstretched all the time. One of them is that you can dwell on positive things as well as dwelling on negative things. So when you do have a positive moment in your day, when something goes right, however rare that is, sort of take a moment to really imprint that on your mind and in your heart that this good thing that happened and repeat that good thing to as many people as you are able to talk to, like tell people about it. If you're a Facebook person, post it on Facebook, like make sure that these small positive moments get as much emotional attention as the deeply frustrating and upsetting emotions. Another thing that you can do is try to make sure that your daily life and the things that you already have to do as part of your life have as much comfort and joy in them as possible. So these are things like if you have a cup of coffee every morning, can you afford to switch it up for the best possible coffee? So that the coffee that you'd be having anyway, the time you're already spending is spent on something that is just a little bit better for you is a little happier, is a little more exciting for you. Like, this is something that I say to people that always makes them laugh and then stop and think about it. Does all your underwear fit well? Is everything you're putting on your body as comfortable as it can be? And that's not necessarily something that's more expensive. It's just about taking a second and remembering that you deserve good things too, and that you should also be looked after well. So, you know, if your socks, if there's a hole in your sock and your toe keeps sticking out, just throw that sock away and stop dealing with it. Buy a new pair of socks. Like do these small things that are already part of your life, but try to upgrade them so that they help you find a little bit of comfort and a little bit of joy as you're doing something tremendously difficult. And if you can find something that you like to do that you can cultivate in small doses, when I was caring for my father, I used to read poetry uh, because poems are very, very short. And you can read a poem in a tiny little bit of time. And then you can think about the poem all day in the back of your head, unpacking its meanings and letting it wash over you. And in a way, that's almost a better way to read poetry, to have the opportunity to let it really sink in. And again, like it, you can get a book of poetry from the library. That's not something that costs you money. And that's not something that costs you much time, but it gives you a little bit of space. And I think for me, you know, my first impulse would be to like pick up my phone and like read something on my phone, but it was better for me to do something and in the long run, happier and more satisfying to, to do something a little bigger and a little more joyous than looking at Facebook again and finding out what my high school friends were up to. So in general, this approach of thinking about the small moments of your life that already exist and how can we take those small moments and make them better? Because there isn't necessarily going to be time to do a big thing. You know, like you're not going to be able to take a week's vacation to a tropical paradise. Um, probably you're not even going to be able to take a bubble bath without somebody needing something or something going wrong. But you can make sure that you have your favorite scent of shower gel when you're in the shower. You can eat food that you actually like when you're eating food, you know, buy the bread that has the crust you like instead of just getting the first bread off the shelf. And so try to create these small moments of, of satisfaction and comfort. Yeah, that's and great. In terms yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, and then for outsiders who want to support caregivers bringing that attitude to how you can support caregivers, I think is really useful, you know, because often you want to make a big grand gesture, but you don't know what it should be. But like, you do know how to get them their favorite tea. You do know how to um, get them a nice hand lotion or a pair of comfy slippers. That's small things that people can incorporate into their lives as opposed to gestures they have to make space for. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's just a lot to kind of sit back and think about in all of this. Um, 
I, you know, it's so great to hear kind of the perspective from um, someone who's like been through the experience of having a loved one live through that. Um, and as well, hearing from someone so much younger who's just sort of building an awareness of what it looks like to support um, our neighbors and friends who are, you know, in a pretty vulnerable position and situation um, and who often are, you know, really overlooked. Um, in the chat, I did drop a link for um, the, what we've put together at the library for a list of some local resources, um, you know, care facilities where you might be able to establish a pen pal relationship or a phone relationship with uh, a resident, um, you know, some local organizations where, you know, even like with Meals on Wheels, you know, you can help you know, literally feed a senior and then also kind of just drop in a note of care and concern for that person. So um, the, the link um, is in the chat. Um, and I do have a question here from one of our attendees who, um, who says, I understand that TV just on as background noise is bad, um, but what about music? Um, my partner has the radio on all the time um, it bothers me, but how would that affect her with dementia? So that is really personal, and that's a great question. Um, that is sort of about individual neurology. Some people, music helps them focus, and it provides sort of a comfort and a reassurance. And for other people, music is just another form of irritating background noise. And so that is sort of, if you can look back at the role that music has played in someone's life before dementia, you can probably get a sense of what it's gonna be like for them now. Like if there's someone who always played music when they were working, you know, if they could sit there working at a computer or writing and they still had music on, then probably even now with cognitive decline, the music is still going to be helping them rather than harming. But if there's someone who didn't tend to turn the music on, who turned it off when they got distracted, you know, there's always people who have to turn the radio off when they parallel park. Those are probably people that music is not going to benefit them in uh, when they're living with dementia, unless they're actually sitting and specifically listening to music. Yeah, and music is a really interesting um, part of this. For my grandmother, um, she was a pianist and organist when she was, you know, younger and um, you know, she always had the classical music on in her home and we, you know, she for a long time um, didn't sit down at the, the baby grand they have in their home and as her dementia became, you know, her dementia and eventual Alzheimer's became more prevalent, we saw her start to sit down and, and play at the piano in ways that we hadn't seen her do uh, for quite a while. So. Um, we definitely saw her going back to what was familiar, going back to what she um, really had cultivated a love and skill for. So that was, um, it was kind of beautiful for us to, beautiful and bittersweet to, to see her kind of re-engage there. And um, my sister and I both have taken like surreptitious video of her at the piano so that we have that for when, um, when she's no longer with us. So um, that's a really interesting question about music. So thank you for that. We've got um, a few more minutes if there are other questions. Um, I don't know if, um, Haiwan, if you wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how you saw sort of the seniors really engage with art, um, you know, fine motor skills, you sort of start to lose those as you just kind of as you age generally. So I don't know how you, maybe um, saw those things kind of come back, if you saw people really um, have a lot of enjoyment with the art project, if there were any frustrations that you guys saw as those projects were going on. I don't know if you have some, some stories to share there. Yeah, sure. So um, we were really happy to see that a lot of the seniors really liked um, the art projects. And I think for a lot of them, they didn't really have a chance to do art for many years. And having the chance to kind of use different mediums they have never um, used before and do like kind of fun art projects that aren't like stressful. Um, and like we also get to talk during our 
um, sessions. Um, I think they really enjoy that. And it was, um, and me and my friends also really enjoyed that um, short, the interactions we have with each other. And we have um, uh, Danis, as I mentioned before, who um, is our participant with Alzheimer's. And um, I've been able to see that um, she, in the beginning, she, uh, it was a little bit hard to, hard to focus for her. Um, so she would sometimes uh, leave the table where they worked um, and her um, husband would come uh, and encourage her to come back. Uh, or sometimes she um, didn't really do the art and just like watched her husband. But as um, like, we did a lot of sessions with her and her husband for um, many weeks. And we saw that she was getting more engaged every um, session and um, she became more interested um, and asked like she asked her husband a lot of questions as she's working through the art. Um, and so that was really uh, nice to see. And I think in general, um, just this, uh, especially during this time, since we don't have as much chance to interact with each other, um, just the opportunity to see each other um, on screen and kind of do something fun together and talk together. Um, I think that was really helpful for our mental health for all of us. Great, cool. Nice to hear about that. Well, um, doesn't look like we've got too much going on in the Q&A, so um, certainly happy to, to leave it at that. Um, I know I have just some new ideas for combating my own sense of loneliness now and um, some ways to kind of cope with the stress of what we're dealing with now. Um, some cozy socks may be in my future. <laughs> um, I want to thank um, both Alana and Haiwan for being here with us this evening. Um, I do have another link to drop into the chat for um, our um, survey to take. Um, it is part of sort of the grant processes to try to survey as many participants as we can. So if you have a moment to just take that quick survey. Um, one little thing to note is it doesn't give you any kind of confirmation that the survey is completed, which was uh, intentional, but very confusing. So if you find that you've looped back to the beginning, don't worry, you don't need to take it a second time. Um, you can go to our library's website for some more information about, you know, the service project, which would be kind of ongoing. Um, you know, some other resources and information just about um, Alzheimer's and um, a good book list for some of those resources and again, the local resources. And um, I guess that's it. So thank you all so much. And we will be posting this discussion to our uh, library's YouTube page. So if you know other people who um, might be interested in taking a look at this later on, um, you'll be able to find that from the library website as well. So thank you all so much and um, stay safe out there and um, be well. Thank you.